Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman as the man checks into a hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the full test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Good morning, sir. My name is Kate. Welcome to the Seaside Hotel. Thank you. I'm here to check in. Do you have a book in reference, sir? Yes, it's E746. Thank you. Let's see. Yes, here it is. Oh dear, I have the booking and that's confirmed, but all your details have disappeared. Can I quickly ask you a few questions? Of course. Could you give me your full name, please? It's George Hanson. Would you spell Hanson for me, please? It's H-A-N-S-O-N. Thank you very much. Now, can you give me your postcode? G-U-3-8-W-E. And can you also give me the first line of that address? It's 30 Brook Lane. So, that's in Guildford, I see. That's right. Did you give a mobile phone number or landline number with your booking? It was my mobile number. Can I have that again, please? Of course. It's 07047 396 847. Thank you. There are just two more questions. Firstly, what is your checkout date? Well, today's the 14th of May, and I plan to stay for three nights, so I'll check out on the 17th of May. Good. And now, finally, I'd like to ask you how you paid for the booking. I paid by bank transfer. Thanks very much. I'm very sorry about the inconvenience. That's no problem. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, if you don't mind, I have a number of questions to ask you. That's fine, sir. Go ahead. First of all, can you tell me when and where breakfast is? Breakfast is served as a buffet-style meal from 6.30am until 9.30am. It's served in the main dining room, which is located on the second floor. This can be accessed, of course, by the lifts and the stairs. Thank you. Now I read that you have a gym here. Can I use it? Yes, sir. The gym can be used by any of our guests. We have a fitness suite with weight and cardiovascular machines. There's also a swimming pool, sauna and steam room that can be used by guests. Though along with your bathing suit, you must wear a swimming cap in the pool. These can be borrowed at the gym reception or you can buy your own there. That's good. I'd like to do some exercise during my stay here. Now, tonight, I'd like to watch a football match on television. Is there anywhere in the hotel where I'd be able to do that? We have a sports bar on the ground floor, but I'm afraid that's booked for a private party tonight and it's closed to other people. Oh, dear. Will I be able to watch it in my room? I'm afraid the channel that carries the football is not available on the room televisions. What I can suggest is that the gym has televisions that have the football and you could watch it in there. I'm sure you'd be comfortable as they have nice chairs there. I'll do that then. Thanks for the suggestion. Now, I've never been to this town, so I'd like to have a look around this afternoon. Is there a tourist office nearby? Yes. 
As you go out of the hotel, turn right and go about a hundred meters and you'll find the office on this side of the street. They'll be able to tell you all the things you ought to see here. They do charge for city maps though, so come by the reception and the reception staff will give you one for free. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there anything else? Just one thing. Can I have an alarm call for tomorrow? Certainly. At what time would you like it? I need to get to a meeting in town at 8am, so I think I'd better have it at 6am. That'll give me enough time to get ready, have breakfast and travel to the meeting. That's fine, sir. I've made a note of that, and the duty staff in the morning will take care of it. Thank you. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section 2. You will hear a woman on a radio program giving some information about the reopening of a library. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the radio program and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Angela McCarthy and I have come in to tell you about the refurbishment and reopening of the Talbot Road Public Library. So let me tell you about what's new at the library. As many of you listeners will know, the library has been closed for nine months after it was found there were various structural problems with the building that could be a threat to the safety of the general public. As the town council later realised that the library and its facilities also needed updating, it was decided to work on lots of things inside and outside the library. It's hoped that this will increase the usage of the building. The first thing that was done was to excavate the foundations and ensure that the building was safe to enter. You may also have noticed the scaffolding that was round the library for two months whilst the roof's wood and tiles were being replaced. This was because it was noticed that there were several areas that were starting to leak. As you can imagine, the costs of the renovation were quite extensive. The council paid a third of the costs, but we owe great thanks to a national reading charity that funded most of the rest. The residue was paid by local contributions from the general public. We'd like to thank all contributors who have allowed this great public facility to reopen with its new face. With the new look of the library come also new opening hours. The library opens now at 7.30am and closes at 6.30pm on all weekdays. The library used to be closed at weekends but now you can come on Saturdays from 9am to midday. It's still closed Saturday afternoons and all day Sunday and public holidays. One new facility that the library offers is an interlibrary loan service. If there are any titles that you would like to take out but are not in the library, you can consult the National Library Collection and we can order the title to be delivered. The book is usually sent to the library within a week and we can let you know by email or phone. We hope that this complimentary service will be very popular. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen to the rest of the radio program and answer questions 16 to 20. So let me tell you a little about the library's new layout. On a sign outside, just on the right of the main entrance door, you can find the list of opening times and emergency contact numbers. Then, as you enter the library, the old reception area on the right has changed and is now right in front of you as you enter. Of course, the receptionist will be able to tell you about all the changes in the library as well. When you're standing at reception, on the right is the children's area. Here we have a range of book titles aimed at a variety of ages, with the books aimed at the youngest age being displayed just on the right of the main entrance as you come in. The books for older age ranges are then found as you move back through the bookshelves. We have expanded the children's range by 40% and also added an assortment of DVDs for young people, which are arranged in the far right-hand corner. On the left as you come in are all the books aimed at adults. We have a wide range of genres in books, magazines, DVDs and various other periodicals. In addition to the books, there is also a selection of computers that are available for any member of the public to use. These are all up against the wall, just to the left of the main entrance door. Computers are not allowed to be booked, but are available on a first-come, first-served basis. People can use computers for half an hour, but can stay on if no one else is waiting. One major advantage of the library's new look is that we have added bathrooms that are accessible by the general public. These are found on the back wall directly opposite the main entrance door. On either side of the toilets are small reading rooms that can be booked for private functions or for the book readings that we are planning to have. The small reading room on the children's side also has some comfortable chairs where children can sit and read their books. Finally, there is a study zone right over in the far left corner. This can be used by any student who needs a quiet place to study. We have created this area because there have been plenty of requests from university and school students who have said they do not have the opportunity to study properly at their homes. We have provided power sockets here and free Wi-Fi in order to help these students with their work. A selection of desks for people who want to do some work but who are not students is found up against the side wall on the right. There is Wi-Fi available here but there are no power sockets, so bring your computer charged if you wish to use it. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student and her teacher discussing a presentation that the student has recently given. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Jane. Come in and sit down. Hello, Dr. Hart. Thank you. Now, we're here to discuss the presentation that you gave in my seminar earlier this week. That's right. So, the first thing is about your subject. You chose to talk about Levi Hill's contribution to the development of color photography. Why did you choose that subject? Well, I've always been interested in photography, and the intriguing story around Levi Hill seemed to fit in with the unit we're studying. Can you explain again the link between Hill's own invention and the invention in France of the daguerreotype? Of course. The daguerreotype was invented by Louis Daguerre in 1839, 
and it was the only known type of photographic process commonly used in the 1840s. Levi Hill was greatly interested in photography and learned about daguerreotypes in the early 1840s. Daguerre exposed a silver copper plate to light, fuming it with mercury vapor, and then removed the sensitivity to light with a cocktail of chemicals. Hill was interested in what Daguerre did, but actually created a quite different process. So there isn't much similarity at all? Not really. I suppose they're often compared because Hill called his invention a hillotype, and this was based on how daguerreotype was derived from Daguerre's name. Why was there so much interest in the hillotype? Well, with daguerreotypes, only a black and white picture was achievable. Hill claimed that with his process, a color picture was possible. You say claimed. Was it not true? There was quite a lot of controversy about it. Hill was attacked, mostly by professional photographers, who lost business because they had clients who wanted color pictures. At first, Hill did not publicize his method, but eventually he revealed his secrets. The process eventually described, though, was very complex and difficult to make work, and people soon lost interest. Hill was not able to defend his process for long, as he died soon after publication, mainly because of his exposure to the harmful chemicals that he used in his experiments. What is the historical judgment? Some of Hill's original images have been analyzed, and although it's clear that some have been enhanced with artificial color, in many of the images it has been genuinely reproduced. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. So, how did you find the presentation, Dr. Hill? I thought you did a good job. You spoke clearly and accurately and you connected with your audience. One thing you can improve on is how you use your presentation slideshow up on the screen. You usually had one slide for every part of your talk, and you tended to turn your back to the audience and read all the information to the audience off the slide before turning around. I'd advise that you only have the general points on your slides. No one likes to be just read to when they can read it themselves. Give the starting points on the slides and expand on them yourself whilst looking directly at your audience. Thanks, that's a good idea. Now, you've obviously done a lot of research on your presentation, and you gave plenty of quotations from important figures and key statistics. That's right. It's said in the rubric that we should do this. Quite right. The problem was, though, that you did not cite your sources enough. I could see some citations at the bottom of the images, but there wasn't much. That's true. I wasn't sure how to address that. There are a couple of ways you can do this. You can just place all your citations on the last slide of your presentation and leave it on the screen after you draw attention to it. Or you can make a hard copy of your sources and distribute it among your audience. By using either method, you can fulfill all the expectations that we have regarding academic honesty. That's great. I'll make sure that I do that in future. So, what about my grade, Dr. Hart? Of course I've graded your presentation but I don't want to release any grades until everyone in your class has finished their presentations. I'll post the grades on the department notice board when they're all finished, not on the admin office door as I usually do. When will that be? The last one is on the morning of the 14th of November. I'll have the grades up by lunchtime on that day. Thanks, Dr. Hart. You're welcome, Jane. That is the end of Section 3. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear part of an agricultural lecture on the use of the global positioning system in today's agricultural industry. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone and welcome to this agriculture lecture. Today we're going to look at the increasingly important role of the global positioning system in our current agriculture industry. The development and implementation of precise agriculture, or site-specific farming, has been made possible by combining the global positioning system, known as GPS, and geographic information systems, known as GIS. These technologies have enabled the coupling of real-time data with accurate position information and have led to the efficient manipulation and analysis of large amounts of geospatial data. GPS-based applications in precision farming are being used for farm planning, field mapping, soil sampling, tractor guidance, crop scouting, variable rate applications, and yield mapping. GPS also allows farmers to work during low visibility conditions such as rain, dust, fog and darkness. In the past, it was difficult for farmers to correlate production techniques and crop yields with land variability. This limited their ability to develop the most effective soil or plant treatment strategies that could have enhanced their production. Today, more precise application of pesticides, herbicides and fertilisers, as well as better control of the dispersion of these chemicals, is possible through precision agriculture. This results in a reduction of expenses, producing higher yields and creating a farm that is more environmentally friendly. Precision agriculture is now changing the way farmers and agribusinesses view the land from which they reap their profits. Precision agriculture is about collecting timely geospatial information on soil, plant, animal requirements and prescribing and applying site-specific treatments to increase agricultural production and protect the environment. Where farmers may have once treated their fields uniformly, they are now seeing benefits from micromanaging their fields. Precision agriculture is gaining in popularity, largely due to the introduction of tools into the agricultural community that are more accurate, cost-effective and user-friendly. Many of the new innovations rely on the integration of onboard computers, data collection sensors and GPS time and position reference systems. Many believe that the benefits of precision agriculture can only be realised on large farms with significant capital investment and experience with information technologies. This is not the case. There are inexpensive and easy to use methods and techniques that can be developed for use by all farmers. Through the use of GPS and GIS, information needed for improving land and water use can be collected. Farmers can achieve additional benefits by combining better utilisation of fertilisers and other soil amendments, determining the economic threshold for treating pest and weed infestations, and protecting the natural resources for future use. GPS equipment manufacturers have developed several tools to help farmers and agribusinesses become more productive and efficient in their precision farming activities. Today, Many farmers use GPS-derived products to enhance operations in their farming businesses. Location information is collected by GPS receivers for mapping field boundaries, roads, irrigation systems, and problem areas and crops such as weeds or disease. In addition, the accuracy of GPS allows farmers to know precise acreage for field areas, road locations and distances between points of interest and it allows the farmers to create farm maps with all this information. GPS allows farmers to accurately navigate to specific locations in the field, year after year, to collect soil samples or monitor crop conditions. Farmers and agriculture service providers can expect even further improvements as GPS continues to experience modernisation. In addition to the current civilian service provided by GPS, Australia is committed to implementing a second and a third civil signal on GPS satellites. The first satellite with the second civilian signal was launched 10 years ago. The new signals will enhance both the quality and efficiency of agricultural operations in the future. 
very high GPS accuracy can be achieved. However, for real-time applications that require on-the-go adjustments, a variance GPS is preferred. A straightforward manner of accomplishing this is to use two GPS receivers, known as a rover station on, for example, a tractor, and a fixed base station, which track the same satellites so that many of the areas can be minimized and higher accuracy can be obtained in real time. Since the position of the base station is known accurately, the error in estimating the location of the base station using satellite signals can be determined. This differential correction can be communicated to the field GPS receiver in the rover by a radio link, and this information can be used to increase its accuracy. The deployment of two GPS receivers for agricultural applications could, however, be expensive in many instances. An alternative to reduce the cost without degrading the positional accuracy is to use one of the available correction services. If the GPS users obtain one of these available services, only one receiver can be used as a rover and no base receiver would be required. That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of listening test 16. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.